Welcome to CIS 1305. This is Dr. Schusler, and today we're going to be talking about Chapter 6, Inside Computers and Mobile Devices. So let's go ahead and jump on in and, and see what it is we're taking a look at today. So we're going to talk about some of the, the uh, different types of, of computers and mobile device cases and, and how those contents are packaged and, and put together and what those packages are really designed to do. We'll talk about some of the different types of, of processors. Uh, multi-cores, the speed, the cycles that they go through. We'll talk about some of the characteristics of, of personal computer processors, the market today, and we'll talk about how, how those processors are cool. We'll talk about advantages of service uh, services of cloud computing. Uh, there's, there's several different types of, of services that are provided via the cloud, and we're going to talk about some of those. We'll talk about bits and bytes and, and how those are used to represent data or represent information um, um, that the computer uses those to represent information that, that, that we can interpret. We'll talk about how programs and application instructions transfer in and out of memory. We'll differentiate among the various types of memory. We'll talk about the purpose of adapter cards and expansion cards, things like that. We'll talk about the functions of a bus We'll explain the purpose of a power supply and batteries, and kind of throughout the chapter, we'll talk a little bit about how to, to care for computers and, and mobile devices. Okay, so what is the, inside the case? What are the guts of the case? Well, the case contains and protects the electronics of the computer and mobile device from damage. What kind of damage? Accidental spills, dust, heat, exposure to, to, to different things. So that's really kind of the purpose of the case. It helps to keep it all together, but it also helps to protect it. Um, we've got a desktop there at our top top right. We've got an all-in-one there on our top, uh, excuse me, on our top left. We've got an all-in-one on the top right. We've got laptops. We've got tablets. And, and, and they all have their own unique form factor. And form factor is a description of the size and shapes of, of the components that go in them to a large degree. Within a form factor, components are very standardized. In other words, if we have have a, a, a standard form factor for a desktop computer, chances are really good that the various components that we got, that we purchase are going to be compatible with uh, with that particular computer. So, what's inside the case? Well, regardless of whether or not it's a laptop or it's a desktop or any other type of computer. We're going to have a variety of different, very common components. They may look different, um, but the same functionality is going to be represented regardless of the form factor. In other words, we're going to have a motherboard in, in all of those systems. We're going to have memory. We're going to have a processor. Um, in some cases, we're going to have the opportunity to be able to expand, uh, expand the functionality of the system by adding expansion cards. In this case, a sound card. In this case, a video card. So it gives us the opportunity to expand the functionality of, of a particular system. S same thing is true for a laptop as well. In some cases, we don't have quite the options that we do for a desktop, but in a lot of cases, we can add a PCMCI uh, card, for example, things like that, to extend the functionality of the laptop. Okay, so if we think about a computer as, uh, in terms of, of the human body, we, we should be able to draw some parallels. Whereas the system unit is the body itself, something like the laptop might represent our, our, our nervous system or our skeletal structure. It's, it's really kind of the, the inner core of our, of our body. It's the inner core of the computer. Um, so it's the main circuit board of the computer, and that's what ties together all of the various components. Whether, regardless of whether or not it's a desktop or it's a laptop motherboard, a lot of the things are going to be very similar. There's going to be a socket for a CPU on, on both boards. This actually looks like it's flipped upside down. But this would be where the socket or where the socket is for the, the CPU on the other side of the motherboard here. We have various expansion slots here. We have memory slots here. We have ports on the back that would be accessible from the outside of the computer. Very similar over here, we've got um, places for PCMCIA slots, things like that. Um, there's going to be memory, there's going to be places to plug things in here, like a little ribbon cable. So we have opportunities to expand the functionality of, of even a laptop 
as well. But again, a lot of the functionality is going to be exactly the same. Both devices have to have memory. Both devices have to have a CPU. Both devices are going to have a system clock, uh, um, etc. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the CPU or the processor. The central processing unit, in, in going back to our analogy, in a lot of cases tends to be thought of as the brain of the computer. It's where the real processing occurs, the real thought, if you will, where it actually occurs. So it, it, in a lot of cases, it's kind of related to the brain that we have. Inside that CPU, essentially, there's two main components. There's the control unit, and there's the, then there's the arithmetic logic unit, the ALU. These two work together to be able to do that thinking, to be able to do that processing. The control unit, as you might be able to kind of surmise, is responsible for coordinating the activities of the CPU and coordinating the activities of, of the computer. Whereas the ALU is responsible for actually doing the number crunching, processing those numbers, adding them up, subtracting them, dividing them, etc. One of the ways that we can evaluate the performance of, of a the CPU is how many processors, or excuse me, how many cores that that processor has. Uh, once upon a time, processors came, you, know, you had one option, you had a single core processor. And the only way to get any faster was to increase the clock speed, which we'll talk about a little bit more here in a little bit. But the only way to get any faster was to increase the clock speed. Unfortunately, by increasing the clock speed, you also increase how much work that processor is doing, which creates more and more heat. So heat becomes, starts to become a problem. Well, if we can increase the number of cores represented in that processor, now all of a sudden we can do quite a bit more work and actually reduce the power consumption, reduce the heat generated by that processor. So there's this desire to have multiple cores built into the processor. And, and that's one way to evaluate the, the, the value of a processor, how fast it is, the number of cores, and the, the amount of cache that it has, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Okay, so what is the process, the general high-level process that our processor goes through to be able to work on data? Well, it's going to take input information. Input is going to come from our mouse. It may come from our microphone. It may come from the keyboard. But the processor, <coughs> excuse me, the processor is going to take that information from input. Input's going to put it into memory. So when we type something on the keyboard, it goes into memory so that the processor can work on it. The processor, the control unit of the processor will decide what the next step is and when it needs to pull that information in from memory and then tell the ALU what it is that actually needs to be done to that data, whether it needs to be added or sent to the monitor or, or whatever. If we need to store that information, it gets sent back out to memory. It gets sent back out to memory, um, at which point it gets sent on to a storage device for long-term storage, a hard drive, a thumb drive, something like that. If we're wanting to use that information immediately, we're going to send it to an output device. That may be the monitor, it may be speakers, it may be the printer. But that's a really kind of a high-level view of the, uh, of the process that a processor goes through. As mentioned before, the control unit is the component that's responsible for directing and coordinating a lot of the, the operations of the computer and the ALU is responsible for doing the actual calculations. So for every instruction a processor repeats a, a, a set of four basic operations. Those basic operations include fetching calculations and instructions and, and data from memory. So pulling that information from memory. What is it supposed to do? And what is it to do? What is it supposed to do it to? The next step is that the control unit is going to decode the calculations instructions. What is it that I actually am supposed to do? And I want to send those instructions and the data to the ALU to actually be done. Once the ALU performs its calculations on the data, the results of the calculation are stored in memory. So it goes back to memory. So that's kind of a high level view of that process. Within the processor itself, within the CPU itself, there are smaller pieces of, uh, of memory, if you will, referred to as registers. And these are the, the actual locations or bins, if you will, or registers, 
where the data is stored temporarily to, in order to actually work on the data itself. So we may have a register for a two, and we may have another register for the operation of, of, of adding. And then we may have another uh, register that's going to store three. And then we need another register to be able to store the output. So two plus three equals five. So we have, have several registers there that allow us to be able to actually operate on that data. Now to be able to operate on that data, we need to be able to operate in a very specific order. We need to, to have the numbers, we need to know the operation, and we have to be able to have the input before we're able to produce the output. That coordination done by the ALU, or excuse me, by the control unit, is coordinated using the system clock. The system clock is what allows the, the timing of the computer operations to be set up so that everything works. The faster that system clock, the more operations we can get done. So there's this desire to have a very high speed. Again, the higher the speed, though, the more heat that's generated. So we have to there's we have to kind of balance that. We don't want to be too fast. Um, so the speed of the clock. How do we measure that? We're gonna, we're going to measure that in hertz. And gone are the days where we're just measuring in hertz or kilohertz or even megahertz. We're we're up to gigahertz today in terms of the speed of the system clock. Again, all else being equal, the higher the speed, the more instructions, the faster the computer will be. Who makes these, these uh, uh, CPUs or, or processors? Well, the leading manufacturers are Intel and AMD. There are other manufacturers out there as well, but these are the, the big players in the, in the um, CPU market. I think it's interesting, the, the little image there. They're actually pointing at the webcam when they say type of processor, but just below that, they talk about the Intel Core i5 processor. This allows you to start to gather some information about what kind of system is it that I'm looking at. Am I paying too much? Well, you want to evaluate it based on what you see on that on a sheet like this. You want to look at how much RAM that it has. You want to look at the processor that it has. Who makes the processor? Intel. Intel has a good reputation for making quality quality CPUs. How fast is it? How much cash does it have? Things like that. And again, we'll talk about cash here in a little bit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that processor, the faster it goes, the hotter it gets. And again, going back to our analogy of, of a person and being a computer, if we get a fever, you know, we, we're hot. We, we don't function as well as we should. And obviously, if you, you get too hot, you shut down, quite literally. Um, and we want to avoid that as much as we can. We want to avoid that with our computers too. So we need to figure out some way to keep those processors cool. We do that in several different ways. We have several different options. Um, typically what will happen is we'll have a heat sink and a fan. And the heat sink is a, is a metal block, usually an aluminum block. that sits directly on top of the processor. We may have some thermal tape or thermal grease to help pull some of that heat away and absorb it into that metal block. On top of that metal block, we'll have a fan that, again, pulls that heat away from the metal block and dissipates the heat into the rest of the system unit and hopefully outside of this, this system unit altogether, uh, if, if we're lucky. So the idea is to help pull that heat away from the CPU and keep it cooler. Another option we have is liquid cooling technology, um, where essentially the fan is replaced with a the metal block that actually has coolant that runs through it. This operates a lot like a water-cooled car. Um, where you have radiator fluid that goes through and helps to keep the engine cool. Same kind of concept. Um, from my perspective, I don't think this, I think this is more of a gimmick than anything else. I've, I've had um, uh, radiators to, to liquid cool computer before, um, and, and I didn't see a real value in it. It was neat and interesting, um, but it, it's, you know, from a practical perspective, it didn't really serve. A, a real good purpose. Um, there are some extreme situations where liquid cooling or, or alternative forms of cooling really become important. For example, we talked about in class the, the idea of quantum computing and the need to keep the CPU extremely cold, very, very, very cold. Um, but those are really very unusual situations. Something else you can do that's very useful, especially with laptops, use cooling mats. Uh, gives you a little bit extra space for for um, air to circulate around the computer. Some of these mats will have fans built into them. They'll plug into an external source or they'll plug into a USB port, and the fan will 
this external fan will help to, to keep the, the laptop a little bit cooler. Starts to deviate just a little bit here, and I'll come back to the the, the, the bits and, and stuff like that here in just a second. But it starts to talk about the chapter starts to talk about cloud computing here, and the the this section of the text really does a pretty nice job of talking about software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platforms as a service. And these are all different ways of of, of providing computing power over the internet as a service rather than having to invest in the software or hardware within an organization. So for example, software as a service, a great example is Office 365 or Google Docs. Um, you access word processing or Excel spread or, or spreadsheets, for example, through a web browser. So it doesn't you don't have anything to load on your system other than an operating system and a browser. And as long as you've got those two components, and internet access, you can access your application from anywhere in the world. Platform as, and let's, actually let's go to infrastructure as a service. Related to that, we tend to kind of lump Google Docs together, but Google Drive is an example of infrastructure as a service. This is online storage. It allows you to store files, whether they're Google files or not, online. So they're providing you infrastructure in the form of storage online. And again, you have the advantage of being able to access this from anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet browser and internet access. The, the other one is the platform as a service and this is an idea that, that our operating systems are platforms. Windows, for example, is, a, is, a, is a, an operating system platform. Linux is a platform. Solaris is a platform. We've got lots of different platforms that are available. And as an organization, if we're a small organization, we may not be able to afford a server, for example. Uh, we don't want to pay somebody to, to, you know, go out and purchase the hardware. We don't want to pay them to set it up. We don't want to pay them to maintain it. Um, we don't have the heating and cooling costs for, that are involved with or the cooling costs that are associated with the, uh, running a server, the electricity that's associated with running a server, all of these different types of costs that are associated with having a server. We can avoid those by using what's referred to as platform as a service. Several different organizations out there offer these services. One I'm familiar with is, is GoDaddy that allows you to pay for a server that you manage online. You, you access it again through any computer with a web browser and internet access. You can have a Windows server or a Linux server, Solaris, etc. And this allows you to have your own web hosting if you want, allows you to have your own um, email server if you want, however you want to configure it, whatever services you want to pay for. And they take the uh, the uh, all the responsibility for maintaining that hardware and making sure that it's up and running and backing it up and all those types of things. So it, it really allows you to offload a lot of those types of costs. And the reasons you have here on the screen are the reasons that you are interested in these types of services. Accessibility, again, you can access this stuff from anywhere cost savings, the electricity involved with these servers, the costs with, with licensing all your hardware, and your, all your software, the scalability, if you need an additional server, pay GoDaddy a little bit more money and add another server, and space savings, you don't have to have a special server room or anything like that. So there's a lot of advantages to cloud computing. There are also downsides, and this was brought up in class, was a good question brought up in class, in terms of privacy issues. Certainly some of the, the data, you have to be careful about some of the types of data that you might put out there and put online. For example, you may have HIPAA restrictions or FERPA restrictions that say you're not allowed to store certain types of information up in the cloud on somebody else's cloud server. So you have to be aware of, of, of those types of issues as well. Even though it's, it's very appealing in a lot of ways, in some cases it may not be feasible for other reasons. Okay, so back to data. How is data represented? How does the CPU actually operate on data? Well, computers talk in binary, specific, talk in digital terms, specifically binary. Um, very traditional signals, radio, for example, um, television over the airwaves, uh, um, traditional television over the airwaves, not HD. Um, it uses analog signals, which are waves. So they're, they waves. We have a short wave and, and, and long waves. They get higher depending on amplitude, the frequency of the waves. 
And you know that worked very well for a very long time, but computers don't really deal with that. Computers deal with discrete signals or digital signals. Digital signals are, are again, they're, they're like whole numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's no 1.2, 1.5, 1 1.8. We're only talking about whole integer numbers when we talk about digital. Binary is a specific type of digital signal. There's only two states, 0 and 1, and that's what, what computers today deal with. It hasn't always been the case. In fact, arguably, the first electronic computer used base 10. Um, but that design was much more complex internally as far as the computer system, even though it made it easier for us to interpret input and output, um, the, the complexity of the design made it much more difficult to, to build that computer. So as a result, we now build computers based on the binary system, and we, we convert those that binary numbering system to something that we can understand. Now we combine these various zeros and ones, and, and each bit, each single digit represents a bit. And if we group together eight bits, we come up with a byte. So eight bits is a byte. So what does this look like? Well, let's take a look there on the left. We have an on-off switch. And you may be inclined to look at the, the O there and think that's an on, so that means the other one must be off. Well, it's actually quite the opposite. The one it's a 1 and a 0, so the 0 represents off, and the 1 represents on. Or if the light is on, that represents on. If it's not on, it's off, etc. So how does this actually go through and represent something meaningful? Well, if we add all of this up, let's think about this numbering system right here. These are all base 2, so this would be the equivalent of 2 to the raised to the power of 0. This is 0, so it's 0 raised to the power of 1. This is 2 raised to the power of 2. 0, 0, 0. This is 2 raised to the power of 6. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 2 to the power of 6. 2 to the power of 6 is, I believe, 64. So 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32, times 2 is 64. 64 plus 1 is 65. 65 plus 2 raised to the power of 0. And that's 4. So 62 plus 4 is 60. Or excuse me, 64 plus 4 is 8. 68, 69. So if we look up in ASCII, the number for 69 decimal we should see the letter 8, or excuse me, the letter E. And that's basically how that works. The, the byte is converted by looking at an ASCII table, and the ASCII table tells us exactly what letter it is. When we type in an E, for example, on the keyboard, the computer does not understand the letter E that was typed. Rather, it converts that signal into binary, into an 8-bit number, in this case, 01000. 101, and that's how it's stored in the computer system and how it's operated on. So again, how does that process actually work? When we type in the key, in this case if we type in the letter T on the keyboard, the key is going to convert that signal into a special code called a scan code. That scan code is going to be processed by the circuits inside the computer itself, and it's going to be compared against an ASCII table. That scan code is then going to be converted into that binary code, and that binary code can then be processed for however we're going to, to, to deal with it internally, whether we're going to send it to an output device, store it, print it, or whatever. Okay, so we talked earlier a little bit about memory, and, and that there's several different times, and this is something that comes up several times in this chapter. Uh, memory consists of electronic components that store instructions waiting to be executed by the processor, data needed by those instructions, and the results of the processing data. So in, in general, we're going to have three categories of, of, of information that are stored in memory. We're going to have the operating system itself, we're going to have the various applications that we fire up, and then we're going to have the programs or, or, or the actual files that we create or that we're using. Um, loaded into memory. So the, the 
Within memory, we have what's referred to as random access memory. It's, in other words, we're able to access very specific parts of memory, and the book tries to relate it to a stadium full, full of uh, 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 various seats. We can access certain seats, but we can't access other seats. Some seats are already filled. So if we have anybody else that comes in, we can't put them in a seat that already has a person in it. We have to find a piece, uh, find a seat that does not have a person in it. The same thing happens with, with respect to memory. When we go and we load a, or, or fire up our operating system and start to load programs and load files, the operating system has to look into memory to find out which spots in memory do not currently have anything loaded. And then it's able to use those for whatever purpose we're trying to, to use. Once memory fills up, we can't open any more files. We can't load any more programs. In general, we have a couple of different classes of memory. We have volatile memory and we have non-volatile memory. Volatile memory refers to, to being able to lose the data that's in that memory. So if we were to lose power, for example, anything that's in memory is gone. We lose it. Uh, and, and that's why it's volatile. If we lose power, it's gone. As, this is as, as opposed to non-volatile memory. If we lose power, that information is still going to be there. And this, this, examples of this include read-only memory, flash memory, things like that. So how does this process work? How do, you know, when we load things, how, how do they get in and out of memory? Well, essentially when we first boot up the computer, the, the BIOS is going to go through a process of looking around different devices for something that's bootable. Usually this is going to be the hard drive. It's going to identify the operating system on the hard drive, and it's going to go ahead and load it into memory. It says this part of memory is dedicated to the operating system. At that point, we're able to use it. We have our graphical user interface loaded, and we decide we want to, to run a program, in this case, a, a browser. So when we click on the browser button, the operating system is going to go and say, OK, I need, need to load this program. I need to find a place in memory. I need to find some part, uh, parts of memory that have, are not being used and I want to load the browser. And then we can use the browser, we can access the sites and all that type of stuff. Let's say we want to start up a, a program like Paint. Same exact process. The operating system is going to go find empty space in, in memory and load that application. So now we've got more and more memory being used. Well, if we want to reclaim some of that memory, we can close a program. In this case, if we close the browser, the operating system is responsible for going and pulling that information out of memory, and it's no longer taking up that space in memory. That's assuming that the, the software is acting properly. Um, in some cases, you'll end up with some sloppy code, and, and sometimes you'll end up with memory that doesn't completely get cleared out. And this is why it's so important to reboot your computer periodically to help flush out everything that's in memory. A couple of ways of looking at RAM is also whether or not it's static or dynamic. In most cases in, in our home computers, we're going to have a lot of dynamic RAM. Uh, what I discussed in class is that for the most part, you're going to see DDR RAM, whether it's 2, 3, or 4. You're not going to see a lot of Rambus, though you, you certainly may. But uh, for the most part, you're going to see DDR RAM. I've never been a big proponent of um, buying RAM generically, rather I think it, it, you're better off to actually go and look up, usually through some sort of a memory configuration tool. Uh, Kingston, for example, has them, Some Simple Tech, uh, Viking, they all have their own memory configurators that allows you to type in you, either the manufacturer of your computer or the manufacturer of the motherboard and, and the model numbers of, of those and be able to identify a very specific memory that has been tested on that motherboard. And, and that way you don't have any sort of compatibility issues. And I think it's a much better way of, of purchasing RAM for your system. That way you know you've got something that's been tested with your specific hardware. As far as upgrading your RAM, uh, I, I think just about anybody can do it. Uh, you, know, you do want to be careful. You do want to take your time. You do want to be very observant. Uh, one of the things I want you to notice is that these sticks of memory are all keyed. They have little slots right here. And while they look like they're kind of in the middle, they're actually offset just a little bit. And this is so that you can only put the memory in one way. If the slot does not line up, do not force the, the stick of memory into the memory slot. It won't work. 
Um, it's just, you just gonna create problems for yourself. But for the most part, as long as you take your time, as long as you're you're careful um, and, and observant, you shouldn't have any problems upgrading your own memory. You do want to be careful about things like anti-static discharge and things like that. But uh, it, it is something that virtually anybody can do. What you have here are individual memory chips, and these are all mounted on a memory module or a stick of memory. And those sticks are inserted into a memory slot. Another type of memory is cache memory, C-A-C-H-E, cache memory. This is a real high-speed, expensive form of memory. And this is really something that's designed to make sure that it, it, it is able to load data into the processor as fast as possible. The processor is extremely fast, significantly faster than RAM, which is significantly faster than long-term storage, such as a hard drive. So we need some kind of memory that's much faster and is able to feed data to the processor um, so that it doesn't sit idle and, and not being utilized. And that's where, where cache comes in. We've got several different layers of cache. We have L1, L2, and L3 cache. L1 and L2 are both located on the processor itself. L1 is extremely close um, and very high speed to the, the ALU and the, the control unit. L2 is a little bit further away, still extremely fast, not quite as fast as L1. And then L3 is usually actually uh, um, on the motherboard itself rather than on the processor. Um, the reason that we don't have a system made up of only cache, we can get rid of RAM, right? Cache is usually very expensive. It's very high speed, but that comes at a cost, in this case, literal cost. It, it costs a lot of money for, for cache. So um, again, if you're evaluating CPUs and you're interested in performance, cost is, is, is less of an issue. You're interested in performance. You want to look for the, the speed, the number of hertz, gigahertz that the processor is. You want to look at how many cores that it has. And you also want to look at how much cache that it has relative to other, other processors. Another way of looking at memory is whether or not it's, it's uh, uh, read-only memory or not. Read-only memory refers to memory chips that store permanent data, or at least for the most part, are permanent data. Um, in a lot of cases, this is referred to as firmware. And, and the idea is, is that it really doesn't have to be overwritten. Having said that, sometimes it needs to be overwritten. And, and this is where flashing comes in. It allows us to actually flash that memory that's not designed to be to be uh, overwritten very often. Um, and this allows us to sometimes fix bugs that exist in the firmware. Uh, it allows us to extend the functionality of firmware, things like that. How do we, how do we discuss the performance of, of memory? Well, we're talking about their, their access time, how much time, how fast is that memory? So access time is the amount of time it takes the processor to be able to read from memory. The faster that we can read from memory, the faster that memory is going to be. And as I mentioned earlier, memory is extremely fast relative to long-term storage, such as a such as a hard drive. It's just not as fast as a processor. In this case, you can see that blinking an eye, um, you, you can process a lot of instructions in the amount of time that it takes to blink just a, a single blink. How do we extend the functionality of a computer? Well, we can use various adapter cards and plug them into to expansion slots. Adapter cards include things like uh, TV tuner cards, video cards, video capture cards, sound cards, network cards. There's lots and lots and lots of different types of adapter cards that we have uh, uh, available to us. And it really depends uh, on, on what it is that we're trying to do. We may be trying to add a second network card to our system, for example. Um, our motherboard may not have a have a, a video card built onto it, so we may need an expansion card that has video. And those get plugged into expansion slots. We have to make sure that our expansion card is the same type as our expansion slot. So in other words, there are AGP cards uh, that get plugged into AGP slots, the PCI cards that get plugged into PCI slots, PCI Express, etc. So there's several different standards that are out there. We have to make sure that our card and the expansion slots that we have are the same. In about 1995, Windows 95 was released, and Windows 95 had a term that's kind of associated with it, uh, referred to as plug and play. And the idea was that 
that you could plug in a, an expansion card into an expansion slot and it would automatically detect and install the drivers for you. Uh, it kind of got a bad rap initially. It was sometimes referred to jokingly as plug and pray, uh, but it's, it's gotten quite a bit better since then and it works really very well. No longer do you have to manually install drivers to get devices to work. For the most part, when you plug something in, devices are automatically detected and loaded and things work pretty smoothly anymore. Other types of expansions for things like laptops, you may have USB adapters that get plugged in, you may have express cards or PCMCI cards that get plugged into laptops, but the idea is exactly the same. It extends the functionality of the computer. Now when we plug these devices into the computer, they have to be able to talk to our, our, our CPU. They have to be able to communicate with memory and things like that. That's where this idea of a bus comes in. A bus allows the various devices both inside uh, and, and attached to the system to communicate with each other via data buses, address buses, etc. The width of that bus or how fast, uh, uh, how much data we're able to process at a, uh, you know, over a unit of uh, time is referred to as the word size. So in general, our, our computer probably has three different types of bus that exist in it. We've got a system bus, sometimes referred to as a front side bus. We've got a back side bus, and then we've got an expansion bus. The system bus, or the front side bus, is the, the communication link between the CPU and RAM. So as we send information to and from RAM, we do that through the system bus. The back side bus is the communication link between RAM, or excuse me, between the CPU and our cache memory. So again, it allows us to be able to send that data back and forth to and from cache. The next one is the expansion bus, and this is what allows the CPU to be able to communicate with those expansion devices, whether they be uh, network cards or, or uh, uh, USB devices, things like that. That's where the data goes back and forth between the CPU and those types of devices. Now, computers got to be powered. They don't just, you know, run off thin air. You've got to have some way of, of, of powering these systems. On the right at the top there you've got a desktop power supply and on the bottom you've got a laptop power supply. And both of these provide power to the motherboard as well as the various other components inside the system. Mobile computers, same kind of thing whether it's a, a smartphone or it's a laptop, they'll use a battery. In a way this is a lot like a, a UPS for mobile devices. You'll have an external power supply as we have right there on the bottom right that plugs into the device that actually provides the power. But in most cases we're actually running off of the battery and this allows us when we lose power our device can continue to function. So our, our batteries actually give us a little bit more protection than we might have in our regular system, a home system. So in this chapter, we talked about a lot of the different types of components that are inside the computer. We talked about the motherboard, and memory, and the CPU. Uh, and so we talked about all those components and, and the general functions of what those, those components do. We talked about processors and, and the different steps in the machine cycle. And we talked about some of the, the importance of cooling our systems. We talked about the advantages and services of cloud computing and, and, and kind of where all of that's going talked about how memory stores data and we talked about some of the different types of memory. We also talked about adapters, buses, and power supplies and batteries. And then like I said, throughout we kind of talked about how to, how to go about caring for your computer in terms of keeping it cool, how to, to, to look for uh, a quality computer, looking at the, the speed of the CPU, the number of cores, etc. So that is chapter six. If you have any questions, shoot me a message. Um, I think it's a, a pretty interesting chapter and this one's actually laid out fairly well. Uh, the, the security chapter was, was a good chapter too, it just wasn't laid out as, as well. But this is a good chapter, it's laid out well and uh, it's a good read. So, Like I said, if you do have any questions, shoot me a message. And until the next time, I will see you later.